let's take a look at the emitter follower that we've designed in the previous section, okay? The problem that we have here is that we have set the voltage here so that it satisfies our input signal, okay? And it also must set the current that's going through this resistor right here, okay? The only problem with that is that this, for, this circuit is not flexible at all. If our input signal changes, for example, oh, now we want to accept um, an input signal of two volts peak to peak, we'll have a huge problem here because we can't because this voltage here is too low. So we need to change these resistors and in turn change this resistor as well because the voltage here will change so that we maintain the same two amps and everything continues the same. So there is one way that we can make this circuit very robust. And no matter our input signal, we can always have the, uh, we can always use our voltage rails the, w the more efficient way as possible, no matter how high of a signal we have here. So what we are going to do is we are going to combine the emitter follower with the current sink that we've seen, okay? So first, let's doodle the exact same thing that we had before, okay? So you have V in here, going through a DC blocking capacitor. Then we have our resistive voltage divider that will provide our bias voltage at the base of the transistor. By the way, one thing that I haven't mentioned, this resistive voltage divider, you, can't, you, you don't need to always use like resistive voltage divider like this. You can, for example, have the same thing we did here using um, the diodes, or in this case, you could also use, for example, a Zener diode to provide, to create a, a sort of supply rail around here. And then you just feed that into this point using a resistor. That way you, is, you are not bound to this uh, voltage rail here. You can, you always have a set voltage at this point, no matter your voltage swing on your supply rail, okay? Just so that, you know, you can also just do that, right? This is very useful when you have, for example, like uh, when it's actually like the amplifier so that you have uh, multiple uh, channels, your left and right, sometimes even more, you can have a single bias voltage for example, in the, in, as a voltage regulator or something like that, or just as in your diode, whatever. And then you tap off that point and you just distribute it through all of your uh, power stages uh, using your resistor. Okay, that's also very valid. So let's continue here. So same thing we had before. This goes to V plus. This emitter. Last time we had a resistor here, but what we want to do is we want to substitute the resistor by this current sink. Okay, so let's do exactly that. Just make sure we have enough space here. Let me start by drawing this. Okay, so V plus. Then we have our bias resistor here. This goes into this transistor. Okay. This is going to be the current setting resistor, All right? And now, okay, we had the same thing we had before. We've just combined these two things here into one, okay? Let me draw the rest of the circuit, just so that we have a complete thing. DC blocking capacitor to 
our load, our load, okay? So, why have we done this? The way that we've set this up, no matter what voltage we have here, provided by this uh, bias network, this current sink will always sink the exact same amount of current. So we've made the whole thing independent from the voltage that the voltage that we've set here, right? So same thing applies. Now, what we want is to maximize the uh, capability of this point to swing no matter our input voltage. Because remember, before we had a one volt peak to peak signal, but if we want to uh, allow for a two volt peak to peak signal to be uh, buffered, we couldn't with this setup. We had to change this resistor and this uh, bias so that the, uh, this point here could accept the signal without clipping. Now we can just set this point right here to let's say, just for example, uh, half the supply rail. So that way we've maximized the, the capability of this uh, buffer so that no matter what, we can put even larger signals at this point. The thing is, the, to get the most uh, voltage swing here, we shouldn't just uh, bias this point to half of the supply rail. Because of one thing, you gotta remember that we have VC set here, and we also have VC set here. And we also have this point right here, which also has a voltage across it. So the optimum voltage for this point can be calculated as, let's put like this as VE, okay? Which is always going to be the VBE of this transistor here. So it's just the VBE of this transistor, okay? We also have VCE set of this transistor, okay? And we have the VC E set of this transistor plus the VBE of this transistor. So let's calculate that. So first you got to sum up everything that we have here. So we have this VCE set, VCE set of the first transistor, okay, plus its V, B, E of the first transistor plus the VC sat of this transistor, VC e sat of transistor number two plus the, in this case, it's VE, but you can just say that it is the VBE of this transistor. Okay, so VBE of transistor number two. Okay, so now. You just sum this up and you subtract by your uh, supply voltage, okay? That will give you the maximum voltage swing that you can have at this point, okay? Just that. Doesn't give you the value that you should put here. So now that you have this value right here, what you do is you just subtract this whole thing from your supply rail, okay? Then, when you get that, all you have to do is you divide all of this by two so that you get the midpoint of this rail, of this voltage. And to get the point that you want here, all you have to do is you sum these two up, the VB of this transistor plus VC set of this one, plus the voltage that you have here and then you will get the voltage that you need to be at this point. So to get that voltage at this point, you, you, to get the, this voltage right here, you just add the VBE plus VBE to here, and then you get the voltage you want at the, at the, the base of the transistor. That way you just have to bias this point right here to the voltage that you've discovered here, plus 
VBE. Very simple. That way, you have the midpoint of the linear region between these two devices. Okay. That way, you've maximized your voltage swing. By the way, when you calculate this, the this this part, I mean, when you sorry, the the top half of the the fraction, when you calculate this, you actually get your voltage swing, the amount of voltage you can swing from peak to peak. Remember, you shouldn't get near this voltage because then you're, you're already like starting to get in the nonlinear region of these devices because some of them might, again, everything has to have some margin. They, some of them might be already turning off, getting the saturation and stuff like that. So be mindful of that. But this is theoretically your maximum voltage swing, okay? So this way you can maximize it. For example, if this was, for example, like 12 volts, you could probably have a voltage swing of around 10 volts peak to peak. And that way, no matter even if your signal is 1 volt, you can have up to that 10 volts, which is pretty useful. That's only if you want to maximize this, but you can also use the same circuit. Whenever you maximize this, remember, you will always be dissipating all this voltage across when it's idling. You'll be dissipating the whole voltage that's uh, across this point and this point through this transistor right here. So it can get pretty hot. If you have, for example, 5 volts here and 0.6 volts here, that means you have 4.4 volts being dropped across this transistor. So if you are drawing, like, for example, 1 amp through here, this transistor will be dissipating 4.4 watts, which is a lot for it, and it will get pretty hot. So you're also dissipating a lot of current, a lot of uh, power on this transistor as well, because it will be the difference between your supply rail and this midpoint right here. When you had this, you got to remember that all the power was being dissipated across a single transistor. Right now, you have two transistors dissipating uh, the power, so it's half for each one. Okay, not not exactly half because this is at the supply rail. This at least has a bit of uh, a voltage drop here. So yeah, but almost half. You you get the idea. You basically you were dividing the power between these two transistors. Okay, so yeah. So this way, no matter what your input signal is, you can basically just drive this load, and you don't have to change any other values in order to do that. This gives you robustness, it gives you, it makes sure uh, that you don't have to change any values and any voltage swing of your supply rail won't affect the biasing at this point. Okay. So yeah, I think that's going to be it for now. So we've designed an emitter follower, we've started with just a simple emitter follower like this of a single transistor. We learned about current sources and current sinks, and we've integrated both of our learnings into a single circuit that's very rugged and very useful. So after all that, I think we should do some experiments. So um, let me clear up the bench. Let me prepare something in a uh, breadboard. Then we can take a look if what we've designed here is actually something that works in the real world. So let's do just that. So what are we looking at? This multimeter is measuring the current that's flowing through the whole circuit. We're just tapping off the supply rail here and just measuring the current between the supply rail and the collector which would basically be where I've basically inserted the ammeter, ammeter here, okay? So, we're looking at a, around like 6.2 milliamps, all right? So, let's take some, some measurements. Let's start by doing this. So, first of all, our supply rail is at basically 12 volts, right? Um, the, so we just measured here, so let's measure at this node right here. We should have VBE right there, so this node right here. And if we look at that, we have uh, 
630 milliamps. Okay, so that's why our current is basically the same. Any difference here is just the accuracy of the resistor. We have some tolerance there. So that's why we see like the, um, we have six, uh, 630 millivolts and not um, 6.3 milliamps. It's just the resistor that's not exactly at um, 100 ohms. Uh, now that we've seen this, so this means that this transistor has a VBE of 6.3, right? So now let's look, let's look at this node right here. So this node right here should be at this VBE plus the VBE of this transistor so that we just have VBE right here. So this should be like around 1.2, 1.3 volts. So let's see if that holds true as well. So probing that node and... That's weird. So, oh, sorry for, for that. Sorry for changing stuff again. <laughs> um, I, I went to probe the this node right here to check for the double VB at this point, but I noticed that something wasn't adding up. I, it was getting like 0 0.5 volts, which means that again, when I went with my oscilloscope to check this, because I knew we were having oscillations this time, we we're oscillating at around one megahertz around here. Have I told you that I hate breadboards? I absolutely hate these things. They are horrible. So, what I had to do is I added another capacitor here. Let me just, uh, I need to do this. That's... So again, just added another 0.1 microfarad here. Just this guy right here, okay? So now we can continue. <laughs> so let, let's take a look at this. Let me just check here. So now let's probe this node right here and we should have two VBs here. So around 1.2, 1.3 volts. And if we probe this point, we get 1.28. So everything that we've discussed before still holds true, okay? Um, so here we go, you have a current sink and you can change the supply rail. Let me do that just so we can look at this. So this is measuring the supply rail. Let me go to my power supply. As you can see, we can vary this and the current stays basically the same. What we are seeing here, we're like at half the supply rail this this current it maintains like quite well the reason why we're seeing this change in current here is because of the current going through the 10k resistor so now we could have some oscillation as well but uh that stuff is is common also we are passing a different current through this second transistor right here since we are lowering the supply rail here so there is less of a voltage potential across this resistor which in turn will change your VBE because it's also dependent on the current that you're uh, driving this transistor at so that's the only reason we are seeing that change in current hey you're like at 3.6 volts and we are getting like we, now we're starting to drop a lot but as you can see it's it's maintaining your current quite well a lot better than if we just had like a resistor divider or something like that. So yeah, this is this is quite nice as you can see. Maintains it quite well. Let's go to like 15 volts. As you can see, current stays practically the same. What you what you always have to keep in mind is that usually you're not um, worried about like microamps. You're usually only worried about your milliamps, especially if this was like the output stage of your amplifier, then you wouldn't have to care about like, for example, changes in microamps, okay? So this is quite stable, it's quite nice. Sadly, since this is on a, on a breadboard, we had a lot of issues, but hey, that's, that's how it works. So now let's take a look at building the current source. So. Now that we've seen the current sinks, let's take a look at the current source. So I've rearranged the circuit. Again, had to decouple it because red words. Um, 
same way as we did before let's go straight to this last circuit which is in my opinion the best one out of the bunch so you can at home you can just you can simulate these circuits you don't have to build it up on a breadboard in simulation it's also a lot better since you can change the values here and see how that affects your uh, the the behavior of the current source and sync and whatever so we highly recommend you to go to the simulation software i recommend the lt spies just pick out like a 23904 whatever transistor you want and just start to um play around with the value see how especially see how changing this value to a value that's too high can affect the stability of the whole current source and sync since you don't have enough current flowing through here to feed this transistor okay that's also very important so without further ado let's continue here so let me write out write some values here we have here i've put again the 10k here we still have the 100 ohm resistor and here instead of the load what we have is our ammeter okay same thing as before this um, multimeter is measuring the current we have approximately the same thing we did before again we trained the transistor so the VBEs change and that's why we're seeing a different current this multimeter we're going to be using to measure all the other stuff so okay um, oh also same thing as we did before had to add a capacitor here and also had to add a capacitor around here. Sorry for that. So same thing here. So yeah, breadboards. Okay. So now that we have the circuit all laid out, let's take some measurements. First of all, let's let me see if I can probe this without. Okay. Um, first of all. Supply voltage, same thing as before. We're still for 12 volt supply. Um, so now let's start by measuring this point right here. Okay, so this is this should have V plus minus the VBE of this PNP transistor. So it's going to be around let's say 11.4, something around that. Okay, so if we probe that point. 11.35, okay, 36. So close enough. Again, we have VB right here. Same thing as we did before, just reverse. Okay. Um, another thing, we can check this point right here. This node should have two VBEs across it, which means we'll probably find around what, like um, 10.8 volts here. So let's check that. And we have 10.7, same thing. Again, another thing that you can do if you want to 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 measure this as if it were a P an NPN circuit, you can change the reference of your multimeter. So take the negative rail, the negative um, uh, probe of your multimeter, put it to the V plus your positive rail. Now, what you have is that your multimeter should be referenced to the um, positive rail, not the negative rail. So now you can probe, for example, this node right here, and you get minus, um, minus 0.629. So you get the VBE. Again, same thing here. You have two VBEs, minus 1.278. So there you go. That's one way that you can do Again, you can't do this with your oscilloscope if your power supply is main earth reference. Just keep that in mind so you don't blow up your oscilloscope or anything like that. Just make sure of that. So here we are. We have a differential um, inputs in the, in the multimeter, so they are not reference to anything. So you're safe. Okay. So after that, let's again do the same experiment we did before. Let's change our supply rail and see how that affects our current. So going down, let's go down to like five volts. Okay, at five volts, we have basically the same. We dropped like around uh, 200 microamps, 
close enough for what we're uh, going to be working with. So now let's go up again. Let's go to the 15 volts, okay? So 15 volts, we only gain like around what, like 50 microamps. So yeah, it's pretty stable and it doesn't change a lot with your, um, with your supply rail. You can literally make whatever you want here. This will stay basically the same giving you stability so that whenever you change your supply rail, you don't have to change this resistor. So yeah, so that's it for the current source. Now let's take a look at the final example that we did, which was the emitter follower with a current sink. Let's go. So now let's combine what we've learned so far, the emitter follower with the current sink to one circuit and test it out, okay? So same thing as before, let me just Put the values here we're going to be using the same values that we were using before 10k here 1k here the load that i'm going to be using here will be 1k okay this resistive divider i'm just going to bias it um, to half the supply rail just because i'm lazy right now and i just want to finish this so that we can go on with the rest of the um of the series so i just put a 10k here and 10k here. This is not optimal, okay? You should be biasing it like this. Um, if this was an amplifier, I would probably just um, put a, a potentiometer in series with each one, uh, with uh, whichever one of these. So if I were to put a, a, a um, potentiometer in the high side, I will just place it like, for example, a uh, 1k resistor, then the potentiometer, just so that when you're adjusting the potentiometer, it just it, it will never short out to one of the rails. Uh, that way, you can set the uh, midpoint here later, uh, which makes things a lot better. In case you are uh, going to be doing something that can be uh, run off the uh, of a multiple um, supply rails, okay, different voltages, then you'd be biasing it according to this that we've discussed before. But hey, that's another thing, okay. So um, here I have a 4.7 microfarad capacitor. Here I have a 100 microfarad capacitor. These values I just chose because they were already laying around in the bench. So nothing, I didn't like uh, specify these at all. Um, something that I have added, okay. So first of all, had to add capacitor here because breadboard and another capacitor here, same thing like here because breadboard. Um, also, uh, I've added a resistor here because of the breadboard, but also in this case, I chose like 100 ohms just so we can cut out, cut down all the noise that we were getting. Um, here you should always put a resistor if this was the output stage of uh, a preamplifier or something like that. Whenever you have a signal source input, um, you should always put a resistor before the capacitor to ground. I would usually place like a 10k, but then you have to uh, keep in mind that this will affect the input impedance of your circuit. Just uh, remember that. So the input impedance here would be these two resistors in parallel with the base of this transistor and this resistor in parallel with all that, okay? So, um, usually I just put like a, a, a 10k here or like um, sometimes I put a, a 30k, a 3k, no, 33k, it depends on what I'm using in the circuit already. Um, this way, first of all, it cuts down the noise a bit and also something that you get is uh, Whenever you don't have this resistor, this capacitor will always be charged to this voltage. This is always floating, but it charges up. When you plug in a source here, you usually hear like a pop on the output. The reason is, is that this capacitor is discharging to your uh, signal source, okay? So always put a resistor here, usually a high value, okay? In this case, I chose a really low value just to cut down on the noise, okay? Uh, so. This is basically what we have. Let's take some measurements just to make sure we're still okay. So here we should have the VB of this transistor and we do have it. 
Okay, here at this point, we should have double the VBE. And we do, okay. So our current sync is working the same way it did before. Um, at our load, since this point uh, is AC coupled, there should be zero volts, and there is zero volts, okay. Um, by the way, you may see that whenever I touch um, anything around this, you see that the, the current changes, okay. Yeah, it's probably some oscillation there, uh, since the input is currently floating. So that's why you're actually seeing a different uh, current going through there. So now, let's take a look at uh, this point right here. This node should be the bias of our amplifier. And it's sitting around half the rail, okay? These resistors are really bad. In terms of tolerance, they should be like 1% resistors, but I'm looking at them and they are usually like within like, literally at 1% of their value which is pretty bad but these are just some cheap Chinese resistors that I keep around to do breadboard stuff um, so that's our bias at 5.9 so this point right here the output node should be DC output node should be at that minus the VBE and it is okay so we have that VBE drop here um, so the DC operating point of this circuit is working pretty well. Now, let's fire up the oscilloscope, turn on the, the function generator, and let's look if we still have that buffering effect. Okay, let me rearrange stuff here. Let's do that. Now that we have the oscilloscope uh, plugged in and fired up, let's take some measurements, okay? So, first of all, we're going to be inputting a one kilohertz sine wave at one volt peak to peak right here at input. So let's probe that point right now. And as you can see, we have a one kilohertz sine wave at around one millivolt, uh, one volt peak to peak, okay? So now, if our circuit is correct, we should have one volt peak to peak as well at this point at the load, AC coupled. So let's check that. See, same thing one kilohertz around one volt peak to peak we have done everything right and the circuit is working okay so yeah it's very simple this way you can just have a, a, a buffer at the output of your amplifier or whatever you want it is current stable you have the current sync so no matter your input voltage you always have the same uh, current passing through this class A stage. Not only that, you can adjust the midpoint right here. So no matter your input voltage, you still get the same uh, output. Yeah, so one last thing that I want to show you, let's just see how this circuit clips. Okay, so let me plug the oscilloscope back in. Let me get the, where's the tip? Here we go. So let's, do something that's interesting. So let's get that voltage. Let me just adjust the scope here. So what we are going to do is we're going to put an input signal here that's a lot uh, higher than our amplifier is supposed to take. And let's see how the signal clips. Okay, so let's go. So two volts peak to peak, still no clipping. 3 volts peak to peak, no clipping, 4 volts, 5 volts peak to peak, no clip, clipping, so 6 volts peak to peak, still no clipping, S almost 7 volts peak to peak, still no clipping, so 8 volts peak to peak, uh, I think we're starting to clip down here, but yeah, so there we go, 9 volts peak to peak, and what you're seeing here, What's happening is since we are on a, on a breadboard, instead of getting like that, that uh, sharp clipping right here, we're getting oscillation because this is starting to become like a high frequency oscillator because of all the capacitance and inductance. But as you can see, we are clipping around here. So let me just go a bit. See right there, clipping. 
Still not clipping on the on the top side. That's because our biasing is not correct. Since uh, here we have um, basically what we have two uh, UVs right here. So yeah, that's why. And this is a bit low. Okay. So yeah, we're starting to clip at the top side at around like almost 15 volts peak to peak. So yeah, uh, we are well above our supply rail. So yeah, so this is quite interesting. So yeah, that's basically it. Let's go back to our one volt peak to peak. So there it is. So as you can see, a pretty simple circuit. Okay. Uh, with this circuit, you can just put a beefier transistor here. You can put um, a, for example, a complementary feedback um, pair here, as we've discussed uh, before. That way, you can have a high impedance input right here, and you can buffer that to drive, uh, for example, like an 8 ohm load. If this was a regular power amplifier, you can... Uh, drive a pair of headphones or whatever you want so yeah it's a very versatile circuit it's a linear circuit so it's not uh, the most efficient thing especially in the case of right here this is a class A so you're burning uh, basically for whatever load you have here you're basically um, uh, drawing uh, double the amperage that you need to drive this load but hey this is only a headphone amplifier and I hope you learned a lot of this circuit because here you can learn a lot about transistor, discrete circuitry. We still haven't um, touched into amplification. That's what we're going to do in the next video. So yeah, um, I hope you've liked this one. Like uh, this is the first video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you stay this far, like I'm, congratulations because I, I really don't know how this video will turn out. Uh, it was quite rambly. I, I have that uh, that tendency. But um, I hope you've learned something. If you have any questions, you can just put them in the comments. Uh, any suggestions as well. And yeah, so see you in the, in the next video, I hope.